It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Natalia Lukasiewicz, who is talking about the maker movement. And I think this is a pretty interesting topic because when you're a maker, you start to experience problems that are usually not really yours to think about. For example, you usually don't really think about marketing your stuff or whatever. And um, you might think about copyrights and this is something where we will hear many details about from Natalia, who has done her PhD thesis on this. So a great applause for Natalia. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be here. I'm a PhD student, and I will present you uh, my, um, my PhD research I conducted on patent flexibilities. In my research, I did comparative analysis, and I tried to analyze, um, I, I analyze the patent flexibilities from the point of view of freedom to operate they, they provide. And I transferred my uh, results on the maker movement. And today I would like to um, give you some guidelines on the allowed use on patents so that you can f uh, be free in your making activities. Uh, my talk will consist of two parts. First, I would like to give you an overview of patents, what patents uh, are, uh, how patents are built. Uh, I would like to also um, explain you the rights conferred with patents, and I couldn't resist and decided also to highlight questions uh, that are currently uh, debated on the, pa on the patent system. Then the second, the biggest part of my talk is on patent flexibilities. I will explain what patent flexibilities are, I will present you catalog, and then I will focus on chosen flexibilities that uh, can help you in, uh, in making and uh, will support your activities. So first, patents. Uh, a, patent, a patent right is an exclusive right upon the use on, uh, of a technical uh, solution granted to an inventor. Um, patent uh, must meet three requirements. Well, these requirements differ, depends on jurisdiction. Here, the, the main one. So patents are, must be novel, non-obvious, and industrially applicable. They are disclosed, the, the solutions are disclosed in, uh, in the patent application that is published after 18 months from the date of patent, uh, filing patent and granted uh, by a patent office. And that's uh, the main difference between the copyright, because copyright is granted automatically, whereas here you have to apply and you have to pay for a patent. Just to give you an example, here in Germany, um, the first minimum cost of a patent is around 5,000 euro, this including patent attorney, and of course, if you apply in more countries, the cost gets higher because you have to hire more patent attorneys, you have more uh, administrative fees to pay, etc. Um, patents are granted for 20 years, 20 years calculated from the date of patent application. This is how a patent looks like. Patent claims are the core part of the patent where you determine the features of the protected, of the protected technical solution. Patent claims are supported by description and drawings. In description, you present the problem, the solution, the prior art, and the examples. Um, patent applications must comply with the requirement of sufficient disclosure. As said, patent claims are supported by description and drawings. They cannot be broader because uh, then they are not supported. And sufficient disclosure is called also enablement. And with this disclosure, a person skilled in the art should understand the technical teaching and should carry out uh, the, the solution that, uh, that is protected. A modern patent system are around 200 years old. The first uh, US uh, Patent Act was um, enacted in 1790, then was followed by France. Of course, the first patent acts were, were the afterwards modified and adjust to, uh, to, to the conditions uh, and the needs, technological needs. Patents have various uh, justifications and various uh, theories. 
Here I presented um, only three I found the most important. First, reward theory. Patents are reward for undertaken efforts and investment. This reward theory underlines other uh, theories, and I find it the most important. The reward is the market monopoly for 20 years and the, uh, the exclusivity on the market to use, to license, uh, and to enforce the right. Then uh, another theory, incentive to disclose, as mentioned uh, already. Um, the sufficient disclosure is the uh, important requirement for every patent um, application. The, the underlying concept for this theory is the belief that trade secrecy impoverishes the, the, uh, the society and the public. And the inventor, um, so, so to say, sign a contract. The inventor reveals, disclose the technical teaching and is granted the patent protection. Um, and this disclosure helps the society to grow, to progress um, and to develop. The third one I would like to highlight here is incentive to invest. Uh, very often, patents attract the investment. The, the perspective of patent protection is interesting for investors to simply pump into in, in money in a given project. Um, what gives you patent. Well, it, as I said, it's an exclusive right, and it gives you the right to prohibit others from using, making, selling, offering to sell, or importing uh, the technical teaching that is protected. Um, legally, it's called um, exclusive right, but this exclusivity is translated as market monopoly, because it gives you this monopoly on the market. that You are as an inventor, as the patent holder, you have the full exclusivity to monetize uh, the, the patent. And here, we call copyright, copyright law, patent law, intellectual property. And this intellectual property has strong economic implications. That's why I opt for a slight modification of this terminology. Maybe it sounds somehow irrelevant, but um, when we hear property, we know that we should protect the property. It's like, holy cow, we cannot touch it. And that's why I think we should call patent, patent law, copyright, uh, trademark law as intellectual assets, because this term actually uh, clearly pronounce the purpose of the system. Now patents are tradable goods, as I will uh, show you um, in, in the next slides. Yeah, questions. So there are various questions about the current state of the patent system. First, patentable subject matters. Uh, the scope of patentable subject matter is growing. Initially, Patents were granted for tangible goods, so devices, elements, some components. But nowadays, more patents are granted on the intangible. The, there is a great issue with software patents. Uh, that quality is often a challenge. Um, uh, there are also biotechnological patents, and still controversial whether we can you know, whether we can protect something that is, exists in the nature. Currently, only in vitro processes um, are protected. So nothing that is done on human body in vivo can be protected. Then patent quality. And here, a small picture. So when you attend lectures on patent law, you learn that there is a state of the art, so everything that is known, uh, above them, above this level, there is a field of obvious solution based on the state of the art. And above this obvious level, there is non-obvious level of technical solutions, because patents are granted for, should be granted for outstanding solutions. That's the theory. In my view, and I'm not alone, the practice shows something different. And this is pretty scary. 
um, because the level of the patent threshold is currently pretty low. Uh, maybe some of you follow the, the website of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They have very funny stuff, namely they post every month a stupid patent of the month. And um, I think it was November, October, it was a patent on filming yoga class. And when I talk with uh, practitioners, they find such examples as anecdotes, and I don't think this is the case, because as mentioned, there are software patents, and the level of invalidity in this group is extremely high. So we have a system with poor quality patents. It's estimated that around 50% of patents can be invalidated, and it's pretty scary because uh, I cannot think of any other industry sector with this level of failure in production of efficiency, but the patent system is doing very well. And I said 50% in general, and around 70%, if not more, of software patents. Bad patents land by patent trolls. Currently, we don't talk about patent trolls. Uh, there is a nice term for this, uh, namely troll-like behavior. So uh, these are companies that aggregate patents for the sole purpose of their enforcement via demand letters. Mm. Of course, companies sell bad patents to patent trolls, simply to monetize them uh, if they cannot license uh, on normal basis. Another plug um, in the field of patent litigation, because of course there are certain patent uh, litigations with patent trolls, there are patent wars. The most uh, famous um, Apple versus uh, Samsung, and others, Google uh, versus Yahoo. Um, as said, patents uh, became tradable assets, um, and that's why I would like to repeat it. I propose uh, the term of intellectual assets. Just to, just to give you an example, Google bought um, an IP portfolio from Motorola, around 70,000 patents for 12.5 billion US dollars. And it's somehow uh, like su surprising that Google buys Motorola patents. Why? Because Google want, wanted simply to increase its IP portfolio to be stronger and like harder to, to be attacked by competitors. So this is the background, and against this background, I analyze patent flexibilities. What are patent flexibilities? Patent flexibilities are tools, legal tools, that limit the scope of patent exclusivity. The main purpose, well, there are a couple, to safeguard the balance of interest the interest of the patent holder and the interest of the society, of other, of third parties, of users. Then they facilitate workings on patented solutions. Um, I will name a couple of examples. And they, are, they are, can be used as a defense in patent infringement cases. Patent flexibilities are known rather as patent exceptions. Uh, the, the term exceptions um, is associated with something rare. And um, so it means that they limit the scope, but to very narrow and rare extent. The underlying provision for all patent exceptions is the Article 30 of the TRIPS Agreement, trade Agreement on Trade-Related Aspect of Intellectual Property Rights from 94, that sets the minimum standard, protection standards uh, globally. And it says, that an exception must be limited, cannot unreasonably conflict with the normal exploitation of the patent, and cannot reason unreasonably prejudice the interest of the patent holder, taking into account the interests of the third parties. It's pretty complicated. Um, this article was formulated in an abstract way, and uh, it sets but it stipulates so-called three-step tests. So every patent exceptions, every legal tool, must comply with all three requirements. And if it fails, if a certain legal uh, solution fails to comply with the first, already the first step, which is limited exception, so it's something even narrower than an exception, it's out of the game. The exception cannot be introduced into the legal system. 
In my research, I focused on, on flexibilities, exceptions, that either allows you to freely work on patented solution or can be used as a defense in case of patent infringement. The main problem with making is its, it, uh, it is its public character. Because as long as you make in garage or in a basement, everything is okay because nobody knows about your solution, about your ideas. But uh, with the moment when you start to share and you post your ideas in the internet or share with friends, and at some point some of you might, be, might be become very successful in your making, then you might get into troubles with patent law. There are various types of patent exceptions, patent flexibilities, but the abundance of tools is rather misleading because the scope of application is very narrow. In my research, I focused on four, the mo uh, in my opinion, uh, the most important patent system, which is Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, the United, uh, United States of America, and Japan. Here in my talk, I decided to extract as far as possible commonalities between those systems, and there were necessary, I will give you, um, I will get more into details into differences so that you can understand and be more aware of the, the slight nuances uh, between the systems. So the catalog, as said, it looks pretty fine because there are various tools, but uh, my analysis led to the conclusion that there are only a few that would apply uh, into making scenario. And here I would like to also underline that none of these tools will support making 100%. It's rather that you have to adjust making to these exceptions um, to, to feel uh, safe and free in your making activities. So the first one, private and non-commercial use. This is a statutory limitations uh, in the United Kingdom and Germany. I haven't found much uh, about private and non-commercial use in the United States, only in terms of repair, and I will talk about repair doctrine in a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, with regard to Japan, I also found only a short comment that the system accepts, although there is no uh, statutory limitation uh, with that, um, uh, with regard to this type of flexibility. So what is about, what is about private non-commercial use? These two features cannot be separated. So you cannot work privately and earn money and then work publicly and do not earn money and invoke on this uh, flexibility. Private use is understood as use at home, within individual sport activities, or for personal use, but as I found, uh, it applies to the uh, to this uh, US system, personal use can be also challenged and found as an infringement of patent law. And then non-commercial use is pretty clear, you cannot earn money. You cannot conduct any business activities uh, if you want to apply, uh, invoke on this uh, flexibility. So here, I decided to focus to tell you what is not allowed. So, of course, you cannot produce and you cannot sell. Uh, I found an example, the use of patented lamp in a waiting room in a doctor's office. Uh, you, if you use a patented device uh, at work, even uh, if you, for instance, if you are a freelancer and you have in your office some certain devices, you cannot invoke on private and non-commercial use because you apply this device for commercial purposes. Um, of course, resale of purchase device, then if you make an, an item here, uh, give an example of a software for private purposes, and then you use uh, the software for public programs, pa private and non-commercial use does not apply. And the last example, this was um, yeah, pretty tricky. Uh, because um, this is a case from 1887 where a um, defendant built a well on a farm and used it personally, for personal purposes. And this use was found as an infringement of uh, patent rights in the United States. The experimental use. I think this might be the most useful type of patent flexibility, flexibilities. Uh, you can find it in all um, systems. And um, 
I said it's the most important partner flexibilities because it serves the technical progress, the further development, the further improvement of technical uh, patented solutions. But the most important part uh, in this patent flexibility, it applies only to experiment you conduct on the patented subject matter. So if you use a given patented device to test something else, th this use will be not regarded as experimental use. There are certain differences between uh, jurisdiction. So the main prerequisite for this patent flexibilities is adding new knowledge. So this prere prerequisite must be met. Then commercial use. Um, you know, certain experiments may lead to commercial product. Uh, for instance, you improve some chemical substance. Uh, German system is pretty generous and it accepts this, uh, this further uh, applications of, of results, but not uh, other system. And so, in the United Kingdom, the, mm, the experimental use must dominate over the commercial proposals. You might monetize uh, the results, but still you have to prove that the main focus was on exper ex experimental proposals. Uh, both German and uh, UK system, they do not provide any quantitative limitations in uh, the provisions. However, the scope matters, so you cannot claim that it was experimental use if you tested a great amount of patented solution in various, um, in various places. It all has to be in experimental amount uh, to be considered as experimental use. The United States have very, very narrow application scope for this uh, flexibility. It applies only when conducts are for amusement, idle curiosity, or strict philosophical inquiry. Additionally, uh, the doctrine, the courts introduce the term of legal interest, um, a legitimate, pardon, legitimate interest that uh, pertains to business objectives uh, in your experimental uh, uh, research. And to give you an example, very controversial case, Dr. John Meday versus uh, Duke University. Uh, Dr. Meday, um, he left the university and he left his um, laser devices, patented laser devices, that the uni Duke University used further with, with students to conduct experiments. And he accused uh, the, the university of, of the infringement of his patents that were embedded in this particular laser device. And the court found, um, well, based its argumentation of the legitimate interest, here legitimate interest of the, of the university was the education. And, uh, yes, yeah, pretty uh, well, controversial and shocking for, for many because it's obvious that university educate people. But to educate people, university gets money from the students so that they can use uh, labs and devices. And that was found as a business objective of Duke University in terms um, of the use of this particular uh, device. Uh, with regard to Japan, based on resources uh, I had, um, of course, adding new, new knowledge is the main uh, requirement. Mm. The, the system, uh, the le uh, legislature allows also experiments to uh, obtain regulatory approval. This applies mainly for pharmaceutical companies that start testing um, certain drugs before the expiration of uh, patent terms for uh, primary uh, drugs to, to introduce generics uh, on the market. So this is covered by experimental use uh, in Japan. Uh, summing it up, you can invoke on uh, experimental use if your making serves the following proposals. You find new applications, you try to understand the technical teaching, you assert sufficiency, applicability, you discover something unknown, you test hypotheses, you test, you want to determine the working of certain uh, patented solution in various conditions. And last but not least, remember about the scopes of the samples. You, it cannot be oversized. 
and what is not allowed, you cannot uh, conduct experimental uh, experiments to, for, uh, to find uh, market uh, information to measure whether a certain solution uh, fits with your business profile or to assert a third party that the product works. There are also situations where you may um, work on a certain uh, solution and later you will find that this solution was patented and you were the first. So then we talk about the prior use. So it's about using a certain patented solution before its priority, before the patent application was filed. Prior use does not uh, constitute uh, the prior art. So you cannot claim prior use to invalidate a patent. Um, and of course, you start thinking about prior use when you, when you have uh, the situation of patent infringement. Mm. Uh, okay, so what do you need to apply to invoke on uh, prior use? First of all, you have to use um, the patented solution and you, it cannot be stolen patented uh, idea. Um, the prior use serves the protection of business um, activities. So if you claim the prior use, you must show that there were certain commercial um, activities undertaken or serious preparations for further commercial applications. And there is no remuneration, at least this is a general rule, there's no remuneration for the patent holder and uh, prior use, the, the right you get is not a license. Um, but to prove the prior use, you must have flawless evidence. It's very, it's very hard. Otherwise, if, you, if the court sees that there is something lacking, then you, you are on the border of patent infringement. And if it's the other side, one may think that the other party simply stole the, the, the idea um, and risk the patent invalidity. And the prior use continues after the grant of a patent. So you can freely and safely develop uh, your business uh, model with regard to uh, the certain pat uh, patented solution. Then repair doctrine. This is very tricky stuff because it's very simple and I think everyone understands intuitively what it's about, that you replace a broken part um, to, to work to, to make a certain device usable again. Um, as I said, tricky because it's simple when it comes to definition and it's very complicated when it comes to the application. Uh, the repair doctrine uh, bases on um, the notion, depending on the jurisdiction, of the ex on, the ex of, on the exhaustion principle or implied license or first to sale doctrine. All of them concern uh, unconditional sales, so there are no contractual limitations upon the use of a patented device. Um, think about simply buying some electrical uh, device, you, you take it and you are allowed as a user to repair it. Um, the underlying concept for this is the compensation. You pay once to the patentee and the patentee cannot uh, demand double payment after um, he got already, he was paid um, for this device. The repair uh, doctrine um, um, is often confused with reconstruction, the, uh, the concept. There are very blurred and clear uh, borders between what's repair and what's reconstruction. So you can prolong the life of patented device by replacing the broken element, but you cannot make a device anew. The question is, what is when? And the case law in all um, studied jurisdiction is very rich and abundant, but it's pretty difficult to, to extract uh, clear guidelines upon what is exactly allowed and when. Uh, after all, you have to get into the patent claims, analyze, understand the technical teaching, what was changed, and whether this, this change replacement is re uh, repair or reconstruction. A reference points, uh, this is the identity and essentiality of the element, 
so how essential, how the element contributes to the technical teaching. Uh, very often, inventors um, explain or intend even for certain, pan certain parts to be replaced, then, then it's okay. Mm. Yeah, so I tried to, to pre present you certain rules that might be useful for you when uh, you make uh, on things. So if the replacement was intended by the patentee, you can feel safe and you can replace an element. Uh, if an element is of a short lifespan, for instance, a syringe in a syringe system, obviously you, you cannot buy a new, a new device if just you need to replace a syringe. Um, then if your working making that does not change the identity of the device, then it, the, your making might be considered as a repair. In the United States, there is an um, idea of uh, solution, uh, the idea of akin to repair, so replacement akin to repair, where you can really change something in the device. But this applies only to unpatented elements. So again, you have to read the claims, patent claims, and understand whether this certain element is outside or within the scope of patent claims. And if a patented solution is a combination, you may replace um, an indiv individual elements because they are not covered by the patent, but the, the combination. What is not allowed? So if you're working, your changes go beyond the necessary scope to restore normal utility of device. If you replace an essential part, uh, of an essential part in terms of uh, in the light of patent claims and technical teaching, and if you remake or make new a patented device, then you cannot invoke on the repair doctrine. And challenges, as said, uh, very it's very hard to extract guidelines to say okay in this situation the, the, this is allowed or not. Um, there are various approaches, legal approaches. Um, sometimes court, one court applies one legal doctrine and reaches certain solution, then uh, the court of appeal applies different doctrine and then you have completely different solution. And that's really tricky. Um, then you have to always identify patents in a given uh, patent uh, device. And nowadays it's pretty complicated because I cannot think of any device that would consist of a single patent. There are at least 10 and you have to get into uh, patent claims, understand what was patented, what you want to change. There is a lot of uh, responsibility on your side after all, unfortunately. Then, there are also situations when your solution might be a might be claimed as equivalent to the patented one. And what is an equivalent? An equivalent is a solu as an element that solves the patented problem, well, the problem uh, in the patent in an equal but not identical way. And then we have the situation of equivalent of non-literal infringement. Every, every patent um, has a certain protection scope. So the core is the patent claim, uh, our patent claims, as I told you, where you determine really the features of patented solution. Then you can expand it a bit by reading uh, descriptions and drawings to understand whether there are other solutions that fit into this patented solution. And all of this is estimated at the time of patent applications. But technology uh, progress is going forward, and there are some uh, solutions that ca was, cannot be anticipated by the, patent, by, by the patent holder, and equivalents are determined at the time of infringement. To give you an example, there was a case um, in the United Kingdom called Agmen, uh, Amgen, sorry where patented solution uh, concerned um, um, erythropoietin, the isolation of this gene, 
And the, the patented, uh, well, the patent concerned isolating the gene and activating it externally and then introducing into the host cell. Then the defendant found a new way of gene activating and was, it did it internally, so in, in, the, in the cell. And, well, I'm not a technical expert, but I found these two methods somehow completely different. And um, it was so that at the time of patent application, this internal uh, gene activation, act activation method was not known, but at the time of patent infringement, the court actually started considering whether these two methods can be found as equivalents. And if patent claims were not really focus only on this external gene activation uh, uh, formula, and if patent claims were formulated more up, in more abstract way, then most probably this, the second, um, the second um, way of gene activation could fall into the scope of patent, uh, patent claims and patent protection. And um, I would like to present you um, way you can defend yourself that your solution is not uh, an equivalent. And in Germany, and in Germany uh, there is a Formstein doctrine. Uh, this is based on a case from uh, 80s. And the patented solution uh, concerned carp stone built on the side of the road. And the technical solution uh, referred to the watering lines in the stones built on the, on, the, on the road. And the infringing solution concerned also uh, stones built on the, the side uh, of the road, but with the gaps between those stones. And the court found uh, that the element was equivalent because actually it had the same uh, function, but it was not identical. Moreover, uh, this is very important if you apply, if you want to invoke on this uh, protection of Formstein doctrine. The court found that this solution was not patented in the light of the prior art. Um, so when I go back to, to this slide, so this solution was outside the protection scope of uh, the patent the infringed patent uh, on curbstone. All, um, all defenses in equivalent, uh, all defenses um, that con concern equivalency are very challenging because you have to determine the scope of equivalence and then find whether your, your solution, your mate solution, uh, falls within the scope of, pat uh, of uh, protection. In the United States, there is reverse doctrine of equivalence. Uh, but first, I would start from the doctrine of equivalence. It says um, that an equivalent um, must have the same function, must, have, um, must um, carry out um, the patented uh, uh, the technical teaching in the same way and must obtain the same results. Um, when it comes to doctrine of equivalence, equivalence um, well, the pri uh, pioneer inventions have much greater equivalence, equivalency scope than improvements. And reverse doctrine of equivalence says that there is a, a literal infringement because the equivalent has the same function. And in the case where this doctrine was uh, formulated for the first time, the patented solution concerned air brakes air brake system, and the infringing one, fluid pressure system. So, of course, all, both systems had the same function and the same effect, but the second one, the infringing one, conducted it, uh, carried out in substantially different way. It's very challenging to prove, and I cannot recall any case where um, reverse doctrine of equivalence was successful. But if you try, then you have to determine, it's much easier to determine first the scope of equivalence, to, to see what is non-equivalent, and you must 
read the patent claims out outside their literal meaning. In Japan, I call it Japanese mix because um, it's a mixture of the US doctrine of equivalence plus the Formstein doctrine from Germany. And in case there is an infringement concerning uh, Japanese patents, you, must, you may seek the protection um, which uh, is in the fourth um, requirement of the doctrine of equivalence. And you may try to prove that your solution uh, is not a patented one is in the light of the prior art. You have to, in other ways, prove the obviousness of this, um, of this element. In the United Kingdom, there is the fence called Gillette. Um, it's from 1913, that was uh, the time of, uh, of the patent infringement and the litigation. And this concerned safety razor system, improved safety razor system of Gillette. And then the defendant proved that this improvement was uh, obvious and anticipated in the light of the prior art. So if you w try to, to protect yourself based on this defense, you have to prove that the solution was obvious from the prior art. It has very high standard of proof. As said, I have to repeat again, the scope of protection and equivalency must be first determined. And it serves patent invalidation. Because when we, uh, when, well, this doctrine of, um, this Gillette doctrine might have twofold um, outcomes. If patent claims include uh, the infringing element, then, and if you are su successful in, um, in claiming this defense, then first of all, there, there is no infringement um, state, mm -hmm. and the patent is invalid. And then, if patent claims are, do not include uh, the infringing element, First of all, this is kind of happy uh, and, uh, because there is no infringement and the patent remains valid. Uh, summing it up, um, I reached the conclusion that patent uh, flexibilities have extremely narrow scope and uh, they do not address making needs, uh, needs of makers in 100%. As mentioned already in my talk, it's the other round. If you want to seek the um, um, protection in the patent, protection in a way that you want to, to make freely, then you have to adjust your making to patent law, not the other way around. And uh, as long as your making is low profile, and the best scenario, you stay in garage and basement and nobody knows about your ideas, then you're absolutely safe. But uh, with the moment when you, um, Go, go publicly and then become successful, then you have to uh, consider yeah, the problems uh, of patent infringements. Just to name a um, few recent examples from, you know, Kickstart, Kickstarter, um, this form lab that was, um, uh, that was um, sued by 3D systems. Um, and then with regard to the patent system, uh, uh, on the whole, I see very strong closing um, tendencies. There's the mind, the nominating mindset is that we want to have strong patent system. A strong patent system means more protection for patentees. Um, there is uh, ongoing uh, discussion, debates on improving patent quality. In my opinion, higher patent quality would solve a lot of problems uh, that we have currently because we, had, we would have simply more free space between the state of the art and the patent threshold. But um, currently I haven't seen any virtual step undertaken to, to solve the problem. Only a lot of discussions, but uh, hopefully, and I hope I can participate in this reform, it will uh, take place. Thank you very much. Thank you all for that round of applause. Uh, and thank, thank you, you for the whole speech. So, are there any questions? 
then please line up at the microphones. Mm -hmm. uh, Here, also in the internet. Where's my audio angel? Okay, let's uh, start with microphone one. Um, my question is regarding to international um, patents. So who has the power of changing the process of uh, developing law for these um, patent-making patent processes? And the second part is, how come it's still possible to patent ideas that you don't have any intent of realizing? So um, technological development is being blocked in a way. Uh, well, answering your first question, uh, who influenced? Well, big companies and uh, powerful stakeholders, uh, you know, that influence the, the lawmaking on the international level and countries. Is it, is so to which level are states being involved and, and the national? Well, um, for instance, the TRIPS agreement. This is international agreement signed by countries. Uh, so these are states, and in case of the TRIPS agreement, the United States played the, the, the most important role in shaping uh, and setting the, the st protection standards. Mm -hmm. And you know, could you repeat your second question? As, uh, uh, I had the intention that it's possible that um, corporations buy patents of uh, ideas or, or um, yeah, projects that they haven't really any intent of realizing. For instance, um, hydro cars. Um, uh, so, but, but so you, development is being blocked in a way because um, oil companies buy those patents, for instance. Yeah. Well. Why is that? Why is that legal? Well, why well, is that legal? Because the system gives them. Uh, if you apply for a patent, you have this patent exclusivity, and uh, it's on your discretion what you do with patents. And uh, you can of course, use patents to eliminate competitors and to block others and to uh, demand a license if you want to, you know, develop certain patented solution. But do they have to show that they really have an applicable solution that will work? Or are they just randomly um, patenting ideas that would oh, hinder I understand. their profit? Actually, your, your question uh, pertains to patent quality, because, um, well, the requirement for patents is industrial application. But there are certain solutions when you simply ask yourself how it's possible that the, there are patents granted. but. Uh, the patents are, and it's about um, all uh, patent prosecution, examination processes. I haven't mentioned it here because it's pretty complicated, and I would like to work in my further research on, on this issue because I think it's mu it, it must be reformed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, for fairness, uh, we go uh, round the microphones. So next, microphone three. Hi, uh, if I invent something really awesome, uh, posters on my blog, and if then a company tries to patent afterwards, is that not possible anymore due to prior art then? And if they try to patent it, if I'm safe then because to prior use? Uh, well, if you post it, then you, of course, this is prior art. The question is whether patent examiner, uh, examiners will find this prior art, because there are cases where patents are granted after a couple of years, there is found prior art, for instance, in Norway at the university. Uh, but of course, then you have also a uh, prior use, prior use right. Mm -hmm. Okay, microphone four, please, now. Okay, I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, um, well, one question is, um, if I, if I uh, invent something or if I make something that um, the product of which would um, infringe on a patent and I post this on a site like, say, Thingiverse, could I be sued because I don't actually sell the product? Yes, it could be, because it's public use. Okay. Yeah, even if you, 
Well, uh, as I, I said that um, as long as you're low profile, you don't earn money, uh, you, you're safe, but patent holders can enforce their rights simply to show that we are patent holders. And if you public some certain improvement of patented solution um, in the internet, you have to consider the, this option. So I don't need to make the product? Uh, you, you don't need to make... What so do just you... publishing the plan is enough to get me sued? Yeah, if, if you base on patented solution. Okay. Yes. And the other question is, how likely is it to get sued? Did you look, for example, at uh, um, software, uh, open source uh, software? Um, no, uh, I cannot answer. No, I, I, I didn't look at the probability. Uh, there are certain uh, studies concerning patent trolls and their activities, how many lawsuits, uh, but these studies are questionable and um, I don't rely uh, on, on them because they measure normally how many lawsuits are in courts uh, by, you know, by patent trolls. Um, you can, well, I, I read the press and there are uh, articles on, uh, on startups being sued by patent trolls, but I cannot estimate the probability. No, I think it would be interesting to look at the number of open source projects that get mm -hmm. sued. Yeah, I understand, but uh, I cannot, I don't have the data. But I know that there are a defensive um, organization, even Linux has some, that they collect patents in case of uh, patents you'd simply to defend, defend the self of, uh, against uh, patent attacks. Okay, thank you. Um, now the signal angel uh, has a question. One please, and then I make the next round. Okay, hi. Thank you very much for the talk. There was quite an um, attention also in the IRC. Everybody uh, uh, listened quietly, <laughs> but they have a lot of questions too, and also similar to the ones already posed. But one is, um, and maybe we also un uh, didn't understand it correctly, but you mentioned um, that one can only claim uh, experimental use if you have a business interest. Is that right? No. No, okay, then maybe somebody understood no, it no. falsely. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, then it all wouldn't make sense anymore. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. you, of course, you might, might have some uh, certain commercial intention uh, in, of involved uh, in experimental use, but always in case of troubles in this, uh, with that regard, you have to prove uh, you have to stress the experimental character of your undertakings that you want to you wanted to expand uh, to add uh, new knowledge, find new applications, etc. So, as a private person, like a maker, I don't need uh, business objectives to have a legitimate interest in experimental use. No, right? no, no. Okay, great. It referred only to the United uh, to the doctrine in the United States because they introduced this legitimate interest to narrow down even the scope of experimental use. But as long as it's for strict uh, philosophical inquiry, then it's fine. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got eight minutes left of Q&A, so please keep it terse now, as I see that there are already four plus uh, three questions. Okay, I have a question regarding European patent mm -hmm. and the quality of translations. So I had a look at uh, some of the translations into my language mm -hmm. and the quality was horrible. I think that it was very difficult to understand what was that patent about. Yeah. And do you think that the bad quality might be a way of defending yourself against uh, patent claims? What, what do you mean that? Uh, I, uh, I mean that European Patent Office uh, publishes uh, European patents mm -hmm. in, I yes. think, four languages which are translated by persons. Machines. And also machines. The, mm -hmm. Yes, into other languages it's a machine translation yeah. and the quality of it is very bad. Yeah. So I if I'm um, a private person and I don't, I don't have to know, for example, English, German, French, mm -hmm. and I don't know Spanish, I think, so I might misunderstood the uh, claims of yes. the patent mm -hmm. yeah. and I might not find the patent and mm -hmm. might broke, uh, so I might uh, infringe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think that it would be possible to mm -hmm. 
fight against the patent mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with the quality of the translation argument. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, haven't, I have never thought about this, but I think it would be a good option uh, to say simply that uh, it was not possible to understand the technical teaching due to poor quality. Yeah, absolutely, certainly. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, microphone one, please. Could you elaborate a bit more on the distinction between prior use and prior art? The same yes. example as the first question. If I build something, mm -hmm. document it publicly, put it on GitHub, whatever has a timestamp on it, mm -hmm. and it will not be found while some company applies for a patent, mm -hmm. but I, it's still there, it's in existence, it's documented publicly. Yes. What happens at that point if the company um, has the patent granted in the first place, mm -hmm. what happens afterwards with it? With the prior use, you mean, or... Yeah, because, you ask, because the prior art is everything that was published before the patent application, just to, to make clear for everyone. So everything published, patents, articles, leaflets, uh, posts, etc. And um, the legal doctrine says that the prior use does not bill does not equal the prior art. So you cannot uh, invalidate a patent based on the prior use, saying that I, I did it, I invented, because the idea is that prior use um, protects trade secrecy. That's a different thing. So uh, I said to um, the, before that if it's posted, then you have the prior use because you invented first. Uh, and if you post it, of course, this creates already prior art. But when you protect, when you keep your business uh, model uh, secret, and there is patent application later, then this, the secrecy does not uh, work against the, the novelty of uh, the later patent. So the best way to defend our freedom to make things is to make them and document them publicly. Yes, I think creating prior, prior art. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, microphone three, please. Then. I, I think you've almost just answered my question, but I'll, I, I wanted to make a parallel between uh, the issue of biopiracy and uh, the maker scene, because it is, I, I feel it's very close in terms of how it functions. Mm -hmm. that once, a, once a company has patented a traditional use of the, uh, of the knowledge of plants, it becomes very difficult even with the proof of prior use to invalidate the, pat the patent and a lot of people recommend that to disclose the, yes. the information as much as possible so mm -hmm. that the, the, pat the patenting office uh, employee yes. could find that content. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that so yes, I feel like it's the same thing that should happen with the maker scene and then I would like to also ask maybe in compliment how much do you feel the Creative Commons license can, can help in that process? Um, I've been asked about uh, Creative Commons license, open source license many times. I don't think it works for patents because of the mechanism behind uh, patents. Uh, I would like to elaborate um, it also in my further research. Um, well, my research, um, in my research, I propose a solution that would work for makers. It's not a statutory limitation because I would fail the, f the first step of uh, Article 30 of the TRIPS agreement, but it's a different solution. Um, there are cer certain open patent uh, licenses, but what I, I've seen and analyzed after all, these open licenses are, um, are created around patent pools. So you enter patent pool with your patent, and you give, um, uh, you you agree to um, others to use your patent. That's, that's the idea, and that's why I don't think that Creative Commons is can be uh, applied in patent law 100% simply by copy paste. Right. And I was just wondering also because the, obviously the maker scene is very proactive in inventing mm -hmm. things and a lot of, so they are actually creating a lot of prior art which yes. is then um, uh, just being looked at by big companies that actually have the money to invest in a patent. And well, the person who was here before me was mentioning publishing on a web blog which uh, I don't think it's necessarily works because it's extremely easy to predate a post on, on a blog. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was always taught that the best way to, uh, to date something is basically to just like 
um, put uh, a description of the project in an envelope and to post it to oneself and not open the envelope. Do you think? Do you feel this is a good option? Well. <laughs> I haven't thought about it. Actually, when you were asking a question, I thought about applying for patents simply to create prior art mm -hmm. and uh, to stop, you know, the patent prosecution after a certain time. It's also a common uh, oh, strategy. Yeah. yeah, but of course you need money to do so, yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the point. Yeah, whereas for this solution, which I, I was always incentivized to do, you only need to, uh, to pay for a stamp, basically. And uh, the, the, the stamp of the post shows when, yeah. when this yeah. thing was made. If you have an as long as you haven't opened the envelope, it is a proof of date. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it should work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, at four, uh, the signal angel is next. And please keep it short. Sure. Um, so, also going to this, do you have other recommendations how to best uh, publish something besides um, publishing a patent? Um, well, as here said, blogs or um, scientific article, you know, uh, there are also websites when you, uh, not blogs, when you publish articles on certain technic uh, technical solution. I think this, this could be, this should be really good uh, option. Um, Okay, patent applications are said too expensive. Of course, if you can invest, uh, you can do it. Uh, but I think creating prior art by publishing um, information in the internet, that should work. And articles, I think scientific articles should be, should be really fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, we meant, uh, concerning the uh, patent documents themselves, um, uh, as far as I know, they are a public domain, basically, so I can copy them and I can process them in some ways. So I could, for example, do text recognition on them and uh, vectorize the images, but then it gets very blurry how I, what is uh, usage of the patent in the sense of uh, using it and what is simply transforming the document and building upon the document without uh, using the pop, uh, the patent in the way of an invention or something. Um, could you elaborate on that? Uh, you mean like understanding technical teaching based on a patent? That's that's the that's your question. I'm sorry. Um, just uh, using it for, uh, for example, to. Um, make it easier to uh, like make new prior art or something just out of the patents. How, what can I do with the patent document without getting problems for patent infringement? What you can do, well, um, you, but you are a patent holder or you, you, you use no, I, I'm, you, I'm, you, you read. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, you, I said, you can try, uh, you can work at home you can try to, to, to work the patented solution. Oh, I mean in the public. I mean, in public. When, uh -huh. when I scan, I could uh, republish a copy of the yeah, document. Yeah, but there's right? not, it's not a patent infringement if you simply republish yeah. public document. But uh, how far, far can I go when I, like, um, yeah, for example, character recognition should work that I um, put this into text, or when I scan it and I vectorize it, but then when I make a 3D model, it's probably not uh, that easy anymore, for example. Uh, based on the patent? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think with 3D models, if you rebuild patented solution, then you might have troubles. But simply posting, uh, you know, the patented, well, the patent, um, you don't infringe. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think it's, I understand. Uh, I don't it's understand. just a bit of a blurry line where the um, implementation of the patent starts and when just... Uh, processing on the patent document. Um. Well, I think then you have to get to understand the, the scope of protection. Because I think this, that's, the, that's the question. You want to know how much uh, you can work around the patent. Yes, this is this your question. If you want, we can know. talk about, I'm sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. no. uh, sorry, can you uh, continue that conservation, 
conversation afterwards. Uh, we're already over time. Uh, I allow for two more minutes. Uh, that would mean, sorry, microphone two won't be uh, getting any speech time. Uh, microphone one was waiting too long. Uh, I can't uh, give it, uh, kick him. And one uh, question afterwards from the signal angel. You all well, both got one minute, go. Okay, hello. Uh, here, there is a very common question. These days, uh, is there any real positive value from the overall patent system to individuals and let's say small companies besides the huge corporations? For small companies, um, I would say that if you have a patent, you can uh, attract the investment. If you have a startup and you have some pat uh, patented solutions, you may simply uh, get new investments into it. That's, uh, that's what why. About individuals? Hmm? What about individuals? Uh, with individuals, but like with no commercial... Uh, well, you can read, you can uh, understand what's, what's going on, what's protected. You can see the borders, what, what, what is actually still free, not patented. Um, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm very critical currently to the patent system, and I don't see so much positives from this system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what's the difference between non-commercial use uh, from experimental use? Uh, well, non-commercial use means that you don't gain any profits from the activities. And, uh, well, the experimental use, if you have private and non-commercial use, the experimental use goes a step further because it allows you public use. You can post information and, um, as presented on one slide, there are uh, jurisdictions where you can have commercial implications from the experimental use. Well, uh, commercial implications in the United States are completely out of question. Um, yeah, but, well, there is, there is no, I, would, I wouldn't differentiate as like, non-commercial use and experimental use. This is a different scope. I would say that, as I said, uh, private use and experimental use get publicly, get public. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I have to conclude this Q&A session right now. If anybody's got any questions, we have a pause after that talk, so uh, meet yeah. our speaker down there. <laughs>